Hello students, today we will discuss capital structure, the theories which have been uh, explaining capital structure till date. Actually capital structure, why are we studying capital structure is more critical. So we need to study what is capital structure. Capital structure is the mixture of sources of funds of fund users, debt, common stock or preferred stock. Okay. Um, amount of debt that a firm uses to finance its assets is called leverage. Actually, you, you all have studied leverage uh, before this. So you know that when a firm has debt in its capital structure, it is said to be highly levered. When there is no debt, it is an uh, unlevered firm. So capital structure is the combination of debt and equity securities that comprise a firm's financing of its assets. So essentially, in capital structure, we are trying to study the sources of funds which the firm is using. So um, whether it's debt or equity, I mean, the common word is debt or equity. So we want to study what is the optimal mix of debt and equity, which is going to be good for the firm. And that is the idea of why are we studying capital structure. And now we also need to go ahead and um, study as to why are we looking for an optimal, uh, optimal mix because we can go for only debt, we can go for only equity, we can go for one combination, we can go for multiple combinations, but why are we searching for the optimal combination? So, uh, as explained, I mean, these are the types of, you know, components of capital structure. We have equity shares, preference shares, debentures, etc., and um, before I go on to capital structure, um, you know, the concept of adding debt is called financial leverage, as you have studied. So leverage comes from the word lever. And, you know, what are the lever here? The lever, uh, as you have studied, is basically, uh, you know, putting force at one end to lift at the other. And uh, the weight here is much higher. So you put lesser force and you are able to achieve higher results because you are using a fixed cost fund. So the fixed cost of the fund acts like the fulcrum. And so adding debt becomes the lever. So if you add debt, it acts like the lever where you can increase the earnings. So what is the objective of using this lever? Why are we using this lever? We are using this lever because we want to increase the earnings for the firm. Now, what are the earnings? The earnings, please understand, these earnings are not the earnings for the enterprise alone. These earnings are the return to the investors. See, the money is not belonging to the company. The money belongs to the investors. So, essentially, if the company is earning something, it needs to pay back to its investors. So, it should earn enough so as to sustain itself as well as give a return to its investors. So basically, uh, we are going to study leverage as to what is this optimal debt quantity which can be used by an organization so that it acts like a lever. And the idea of using this lever is to increase the return to the investors. And now what are these investors? Now see, please remember, debt fund has a fixed income. So the investors of the debt fund get a fixed return. So who gets the additional return because of the lever? The, the equity shareholders. Okay, so the idea now comes that leverage is actually used to increase the return of the equity shareholders. Okay, so um, the capital structure of the company is said to be leveraged or geared when there is a presence of debt. And this debt is actually used to increase the earnings for the equity shareholders. Okay, so now you understand why are we uh, uh, doing leverage and what is the big idea behind studying capital structure. So we say that optimal capital structure has such a proportion of debt and equity which will maximize the wealth of the firm. Okay, now the wealth of the firm, now please remember we have studied the concept of profit versus wealth. So we are not talking about one year profit. Obviously, please see, please remember, we're talking about capital structure. We are not talking about the short term funds. We're talking about long term funds. So long term funds means we are not going to change the capital structure every now and then. So that means in the long run, 
how do my profits happen? And so that is the reason I'm saying capital structure basically maximizes the wealth and not the profit of the firm. At this capital structure, the market price per share is maximum and the cost of capital is minimum. Now, I'll get back to it as to where am I getting these things from. Meanwhile, let's understand that I'm trying to maximize the wealth of the firm using an optimal capital structure. <clears throat> now, what is an optimal capital structure? Now, that has to be defined very well. So we are saying that it has to maximize the value of the firm and it has to minimize the cost of capital. Now, the cost of capital is... Um, the money that you or the price that you're paying for the funds. Now, uh, to get back to this concept of debt and equity, remember the debt investors have a fixed rate of return. So the equity investors do not get a fixed rate of return. So we're trying to minimize this cost of capital wherein um, the return of the equity investors is uh, kind of you know managed. Now, we are saying that we want to minimize the cost of capital and we want to give the maximum return to the investors. Okay, so uh, we are talking about earning per share and we are talking about value of the firm. Okay, now earning per share is basically profit after tax divided by the number of shareholders. Okay, so I'm assuming that all the returns expected by the debt holders are taken care of before the returns on the equity um, investors is considered. So uh, when I'm talking about the value of the firm, it is basically in the eyes of the investors in the equity market. And so we talk about the value of the firm, which is in terms of the market price of the share. Okay, so uh, because the debt investors have uh, you know, a fixed return, so who is more interested in the value of the firm? It is basically the market, and in the market, it is the equity shareholder. Okay, so now we have three objectives. One is to maximize the value of the firm. Second is to minimize cost of capital. And third is to maximize the earning per share which will in turn maximize the market price of the share in the long run. Okay, so the idea is to maximize the wealth, to maximize the market price, to maximize the value, to minimize the cost, and to give the best earning per share. Okay, so now you realize why are we studying optimal capital structure. So that means there is some kind of a relationship between capital structure, cost of capital, and value of the firm. Obviously, value of the firm is dependent on the capital structure, which in turn influences cost of capital. So that means what are the intervening variable? It is cost of capital. So capital structure influences the value through cost of capital. So uh, in the previous slide, we studied that the cost of capital has to be minimized. So that means capital structure is such so that the cost of capital is minimized, which can then maximize the value of the firm. So you understand the relationship now? So the relationship is capital structure has to be decided so as to minimize the cost, so as to maximize the value. So that means these two have an inverse relationship, okay? And we will study this in detail, okay? So now we come to the relationship between the value of the firm. So how is the value of the firm calculated? The value of the firm is calculated assuming perpetual earnings. And these earnings are um, operating profits and we you know, very broadly, we take EBIT, which I understand that you all know it is earning before interest and tax. So we're talking about operating profits. Now, please remember, this is the total earning which is available for all the investors, which includes the debt investor. Okay. So we're talking about the operating return of the company from which we will have both the debt holder and the equity holder take their share. But before we get on to this division, let's understand that the value of the firm, now talking about the time value of perpetuity, the value is the earning, whatever is the perpetual earning divided by the cost, which is the opportunity cost. In this case, we assume it is a cost of capital. Now, the big assumption that we're talking about is assuming perpetual earnings. So we understand that businesses are a going concern, so we um, expect them to stay there forever. 
and we also expect them to increase their EBIT. So now we are assuming that if the EBIT does not increase, it also does not decrease. That means this EBIT is kind of stable and perpetual. Okay. Now the other thing is that we are also assuming this cost of capital also will not change because it is a one-time cost of acquiring funds because you're not acquiring funds now and then. You're acquiring funds in the beginning of your business. So when you're acquiring funds in the beginning of your business, then it is decided once and for all. So this also does not change. This also does not change. So the value of the firm is essentially EBIT divided by the opportunity cost of capital. So this is the basic relationship between value value of the firm, this is the operating profit, this is the cost of capital, and this cost of capital will be decided by the capital structure. Okay. Now, how is the capital structure um, you know, going to define the value of the firm? This can be studied using these approaches. There is a net operating income approach. There is a traditional approach. There is a net income approach. There is the MM hypothesis with and without corporate tax. And then there is also the Miller's hypothesis with corporate and personal taxes. So we have a couple of theories, you know, and they all vary in the way they approach to the concept of how capital structure will influence the value of the firm. Now, the assumptions, again, the big assumptions for all the theories. One, there are only two sources of finance, equity and debt. Second, there would be no change in the investment decisions. That means you're not changing this composition. So, uh, or in other words, once decided, the capital structure does not change. <clears throat> that the firm has a policy of distributing the entire profits among the shareholders, implying that there is no retained earning. Big, big, big assumption. That means all the profit which is earned by the organization either goes to the debt investors or goes to the equity investors, but it does not remain with the firm. Big assumption, so I mean, if this assumption has to be considered uh, null and void, because if companies have retained earnings, then probably all the theories <clears throat> are not applicable. Next comes the profit of the firm. The profits of the firm are given and are not even expected to grow. Remember the perpetuity concept that we did? So we are assuming that the profits are not expected to grow. Basically, we are countering the risk that the profits may even go low. So we are assuming that the profits will neither increase nor decrease. Next, the business risk complexion of the firm is given and it is not affected by the financing mix. That means the EBIT or the operating profit, which is the result of all the endeavors that the organization has made to manage the business risk, they are not affected by the financing mix. So the EBIT does not depend on the capital structure. I mean, this, this goes without much explanation because EBIT is operating profit. So business operations have to be very clearly segregated from the capital structure. Then the next is um, there is no corporate personal tax. Again, a huge assumption. So um, honestly, uh, you know, these assumptions, if they have to be studied, um, now the theories uh, become practically applicable, but then we need to start somewhere. So we start with these assumptions, at least to explain how things would be if things were these perfect, if organizations had no retained earnings, if the investment decision did not change, if the profits were constant, if uh, there were no personal and corporate taxes. Okay, so we assume these things uh, are, exist and then we understand the theories. So now going back to the theories. So the first one is the net income approach. The net income approach was presented by David Durant. The theory suggests increasing value of the firm by decreasing overall cost of capital, which can be measured in terms of WACC. Now, WACC is the weighted average cost of capital. Basically, we also go with two uh, major, major things when we uh, start studying debt versus equity for any capital structure. The first is that debt is a constant cost, okay, which will not change um, unless you know the proportion of the debt becomes very, very high. We can study that a little later as well, but then practically speaking, if your debt becomes overwhelmingly high, like it's about 80%, obviously the cost of debt that you may go on with 
beyond that 80% will be different from the cost of debt that you were at when probably you were at 50%. So um, at very, very high levels of debt also, this may change, but right, uh, you know, for simplicity's sake right now, we just consider that um, um, the cost of debt does not change, number one. Number two, uh, the cost of debt is lower than cost of equity. Now, the simple reason is because cost of debt is fixed, so it is a high priority payment which is made irrespective of the earnings. So whether the firm earns zero or whether the firm earns 100%, uh, what I give to the debt holder is fixed. So the debt holder basically gets the returns even if there is no earning. But because he gets this assured return, the return is much lower because the equity holder will get the earning only if there are profits. And so higher the profits, higher will be the returns. So uh, in the common understanding, we have to uh, you know, <coughs> comprehend that cost of debt will be lower and cost of equity will be higher. So debt is always considered a cheap source of finance compared to equity. So according to the net income approach, change in the financial leverage of a firm will lead to corresponding change in the WACC, which is the weighted average cost of capital, and which will obviously indirectly affect the value of the firm. Because please remember, this WACC was KO, which we had considered in one of the previous slides, which is the cost of capital or the cost of acquiring funds. Now, it also suggests that with the increase in leverage, obviously, because you're including more debt. So when you're including, including more debt, obviously, you're including cheaper source. So if the cheap source of finance is higher in proportion, the WACC will decrease. And if the WACC decreases, the value of the firm will increase, obviously, because this is in the denominator. So if EBIT remains constant, and if WACC is in the denominator, by default, the net income approach says that as you increase leverage, the value of the firm increases. Isn't that um, a little, um, you know, uh, posing a question? That is okay. So if that is the case, why not go on increasing the leverage and finally have 100% debt and 0% equity, and then we go on and then we have, you know, um, uh, the, the cheapest way to finance my company. But that is not a reality. We will study that later. So uh, uh, none of us will agree that very high debt is good for the firm. But if you go by this theory alone, very high debt is probably the best for the firm. Okay. So uh, um, this theory has its own problems. But then to start somewhere, we at least uh, come to one conclusion that the cost of capital is dependent on the capital structure which is basically the proportion of the debt and debt being cheap source of finance. So as we keep including debt, the cost of capital must be uh, decreasing in the proportion of the debt increasing. And in other words, it should actually change the value. of the firm. So this is the net income approach. So the value of the company is basically the total market value of the firm is equal to the market value of equity shares, which is basically net income divided by equity capitalization rate plus debt, which is the market value of debt now um, in a country like India, where uh, we may not have a lot of debt which is traded, or in other words, um, there could be a loan okay, from a bank which could be a part of the debt. So there'll be no market value for that. Please remember, there'll be a book value of the debt. So a market value of debt in case you have debentures which are getting traded or bonds in our countries where bonds are traded. But um, in India, for example, it could be the book value of debt also, okay? So uh, we are saying that the overall cost of capital, if that is KO, then the value of the firm is EBIT upon Q, as we had discussed earlier. And uh, this remains the same, but um, EBIT minus the interest will give me net income, okay? Because this is net operating income. And minus the interest, because that is the debt holder's income, so if you reduce the debt holder's income, whatever is the remaining income, that is the income which is supposed to get divided into the shares. So uh, this is the value of my equity because I have given away what was supposed to be given to the debt holders. 
okay so net income divided by the equity capitalization rate gives me the market value of equity plus the MOOC value or the market value of debt and this is the net income approach to understand value for okay so we we have we are very clear that basically we need to decide on the values of both equity and debt when we have to decide the value of the form um, the way it goes if we want to talk about it graphically basically if um, this is cost of equity and this is cost of debt this net income approach says this will not change even if you increase debt so this is the way debt is increasing so ke does not change KD also does not change. The cost of debt also does not change. But KO, which is the weighted average cost of capital, changes. So we say that KO changes with leverage, and so value changes with leverage. And obviously, if KO is decreasing and it is in the denominator, obviously the value increases. So uh, if I have to represent this uh, approach to understanding value, that means um, the least, the maximum value is if my KO is equal to KD, so an all debt firm should have the maximum value and the minimum value should be an all equity firm because cost of equity is much higher and we are choosing to have a high cost of capital for value of the firm. Now comes the next approach, which is the net operating income approach. It is just opposite to the net income approach. According to this approach, change in the capital structure of a company does not affect the market value of the firm and the overall cost of capital remains constant irrespective of method of financing. Now, um, even if we try to answer, you know, understand this concept, um, you, know, you may like to you know, kind of uh, uh, just broaden your perspective and think of somebody who's investing into the stock market, right? So when you invest in the stock market, how many times will we go back and check the capital structure of the firm. We will go and buy the share or only on the basis of the returns and never, probably never on the basis of the capital structure unless we're doing some fundamental analysis. So uh, my uh, value for a share is dependent on the return that I get from the share and not on the way the company has gathered its finance. Okay, so that is the practical way of looking at the way I would value a firm from an investor's point of view. So this net operating income approach kind of comes to my support because I don't want to agree with the net income approach which says that value will change with leverage. So I need to first go and find out which is the most levered firm or which is the firm which has the minimum cost of capital so that I can identify the firm which has the highest value and then I decide to invest. So when I'm not taking that into consideration, probably my behavior is being explained by the net operating income approach. So basically, we're saying that net operating income approach basically tries to explain the behavior of investors where the market value that they assign to the shares, which is the market value of the firm, it actually is ir independent of the capital structure. Okay. So they say that there is nothing like an optimal capital structure. Now, obviously, uh, if we go blindly and completely by this, then this approach also says that whether I have zero as debt or 20 as debt or 50 as debt, nothing will matter. But does that also mean that whether I'm an all equity firm or whether I'm an all debt firm, my value remains the same? Okay, this is a point where we need to consider thinking that is this approach also completely applicable? Again, may not be because... If my company is zero debt or if my company is 80% debt, I need to think um, and somewhere down the line it is going to impact me. But then this approach kind of, you know, does not even talk about it. So even this approach may have its own problems. Okay, so uh, what about this approach? So this approach says that if I increase leverage, which is I increase debt, obviously KD does not change. Um, again, we'll have to see whether it actually does not change practically or not. It also says KO does not change, which means cost of capital, overall cost of capital does not change. But then what changes? What changes is the cost of equity. This is basically the earning expected by the shareholders as I am adding more debt. So this approach says that when you add debt, nothing happens anywhere excepting that the cost of equity increases basically the expected return on 
the shareholders kind of increasing. Now uh, we have to think about it that we as investors, sometimes we are not bothered about the debt, but sometimes we do get bothered about the debt. And if we get bothered about the debt, what do we do? We either leave the company or we want higher returns because we know that there is somebody who's going to drain out my EBIT before it comes to me. So as an investor, I need to see how much of it is going to go out and how much is going to get uh, remaining from me. So I have to be sure that I get some return at least before um, you know the income uh, is actually given away to the debt holder. So the proportion of debt becomes critical for me. But then, okay, that's a practical perspective which needs to be blended with this net operating income approach. But on the face of it, this theory says that cost of equity actually increases in such a proportion that it kind of compensates because otherwise cost of uh, you know capital should decrease because of inclusion of cheaper source of uh, finance, which is debt. But to compensate this completely, cost of equity kind of increases. And so compensately, um, the cost of capital kind of remains the same. So again, because KO remains the same, I'm assuming EBIT also does not change, the value does not change. So this theory states, whatever be the debt, um, my KO does not change, so my value does not change. We need to think about it. But then this approach states that. So here it is that EBIT uh, will uh, is you know uh, constant. KO is constant. So KO does not change with leverage. So cost of capital of a levered firm, cost of capital of an unlevered firm is equal to each other, and they are equal to the opportunity cost of capital. Now this is a huge thing which we need to analyze. Is it so? Is cost of capital same for a levered and an unlevered firm? Okay, this needs to be answered. And so even this approach has its own problems that we cannot assume these things to be true on from a practical perspective. Okay, so then we have a traditional approach. There's another way to look at capital structure and the traditional approach is also called an intermediate approach. It is a composite compromise between the two extremes of net income approach and net operating income approach. Here it says that the value of the firm can be increased initially or the cost of capital can be decreased by using more debt as debt is a cheaper source of funds. So we are saying that cost of capital actually decreases initially and uh, beyond a particular point, the cost of equity starts increasing because increased debt increases the financial risk the way we had discussed. So they say that um, cost of equity may not initially increase, but it does increase subsequently. So the advantage of this cheap debt is offset by the increased cost of equity. This is something similar to the net operating income approach. And then with increased cost of equity, again, there's so much of increase in the cost of equity that overall the cost of debt um, you know, does not compensate it. And so the overall cost of capital actually rises. So this traditional approach says that no, if you add debt, the cost of capital actually increases or rises beyond a certain point. So that means the cost of capital will not be the same. It will neither decrease proportionally as in the net income approach, nor will it remain constant as in the net operating income approach, but it increases or rises beyond a certain point. That means it is optimal till certain point and rises after that. This is the traditional approach. Okay. So um, they say that moderate degree of debt can lower the firm's overall cost of capital. So you see it's lowering down here because cost of equity does not increase in the proportion of cost of debt. Okay. But then after that, it kind of increases a little more in value. So you see the curve becomes a little steeper here. So when it becomes a little steeper here, then it is only then that the cost of capital starts rising. So till here, cost of capital is at its minimum. So then traditional approach says that there is an optimal capital structure which is possible, which is an optimal mix of debt and equity wherein the cost of debt increases but does not increase so much. And there is a cost of debt which is a lower cost. And so the overall WACC or the opportunity cost decreases. Okay, so this sounds more practical, right? Because it is neither... Uh, 
very restrictive like the net income approach it is neither restrictive like the net operating income approach and it leaves a little bit of flexibility and this sounds quite okay because beyond a particular time um, cost of equity will actually rise very very steeply because this is like too much debt for the company and when this happens this cost of equity is just so high that cost of debt does not compensate it in any way so the cost of capital becomes comparatively much higher so um, we had these three theories which kept on talking about um, whether there is an optimal capital structure or not but then there are two philosophers Mondiglani and Miller they were researchers and uh, they studied the concept of uh, capital structure in detail but let's understand because they also proposed theories and they, these theories had to be based on certain assumptions again now they had a separate set of assumptions you know because obviously this they worked on them later so initially when they started with the assumptions were that there were no tax there were no taxes this perfect capital market investors act rationally they have homogeneous expectations there is no flotation cost all earnings are distributed to the shareholder this is similar to their assumptions with other theories bonds and stocks trade in perfect markets investors can borrow and lend at the same rate there are no agency costs and investment and financing decisions are independent of each other okay so uh, this is for the company uh, and the investor and this is for the company only okay so now see if i'm talking about all of them i think all of them have a problem so if i talk about these assumptions this approach will also not be applicable but then again this is a pr approach which is probably the most acceptable as of now and this was devised by modiglani and miller during 1950s it resembles the net operating income approach where they have said that capital structure is not relevant that is value of the firm is irrelevant to the capital structure so that means what is more critical is not the capital structure but then what is critical they said that what is critical is the future growth prospect so market value of a firm is affected by its future growth prospect apart from the risk involved in the investments okay so the theory stated that the value of the firm is not independent on the choice of capital structure or financing decision if a company has high growth prospects its market value is higher and hence its stock prices would be high if investors do not see attractive growth prospects in a firm the market value of that firm would not be high okay so this is like a forward looking approach which says there's no point looking at the capital structure what you have to see is the future so there were two propositions of this theory and this proposition is number one that market value of the company is not affected by the capital structure so if there are no taxes no agency costs no cost of distress so the investors would value the firm with the same cash flows as the same regardless of how the firms are financed and so there is say there is no benefit to borrowing at the firm level because there is no interest deductibility because there are no, there are no taxes there are not there's no tax benefit of interest so firms are indifferent key from to the source of capital and they can um, investors are also indifferent to the type of leverage of the company okay so they say that market value is independent of its capital structure proposition 2 of the theory says cost of equity is a linear function of the company's debt equity ratio because creditors have a claim to income and assets that has a preference over equity cost of debt will be less than cost of equity okay and so if, as a company uses more debt in capital structure cost of equity increases because of seniority of the debt okay so uh, they say that if this has to remain constant and if we are adding debt then this has to get compensated by additional cost of equity okay and this cost of equity stand alone is cost of equity if there is no debt financing okay so we start with cost of equity where there is no debt but we please remember that cost of equity will increase as i keep adding this debt 
Now this approach was further modified and it was studied with taxes. So uh, the original model which was done in 1958 had a lot of changes because both individuals and companies had to pay taxes. They corrected their assumption and came with another version of their model. And they said that um, basically uh, their, the tax regimes permit the companies to offset the interest paid on debt against taxable profit. The effect of this is a tax saving which reduces the cost of cap. So that means value of a debt will change with inclusion of debt in capital structure. Okay, value of a company will change with inclusion of debt and capital structure. Why? Because there is some tax benefit because of the debt. It's just that simple. So because there is interest paid on debt, which is offset and uh, because of the tax, so there is a tax saving that you get because of the debt. And so that is the only change. So the value would have remained the same had there been no tax. But the fact that now we have taxes, that means the company tries to take an advantage of the taxes. So to take an advantage of the taxes, obviously the value of a firm which has the advantage of a tax versus the value of the firm which does not have an advantage of the tax is going to be different, even if the EBIT is the same. Okay. So uh, value of the firm then becomes EBIT and cost of capital net of taxes. Okay. And there is another very important concept here that the value of the firm which is now levered because they've added some debt is basically that there is an unlevered firm value which would have other remain, it which would have remained the same had it been the net operating income approach. But it says that no, this does not happen, and we add something called tax advantage of the debt. So because of this tax advantage of the debt, the value of the levered firm is always more than the value of the unlevered firm. Okay, so this is the big concept of the MM theory with taxes. That the value of the levered firm is more than the value of the unlevered firm only because of the tax advantage of the debt. Okay, so if you see this, this is the after tax earning of the firm. So the value of an unlevered firm will be this, which is the cost of capital of an unlevered firm. Now, after tax earnings for a levered firm is when you have reduced this interest. So this is EBIT minus interest. So it is earning before tax. And so now one minus tax. So this becomes earning after tax. So this essentially becomes the PAT. And then you have interest also, which is the earning for the debt. Okay, so then this is the earning for the equity. And this is the earning for the debt. So the value of the firm has to take care of both of them. Now this, um, the, the tax shield that I am getting because of this tax benefit is a perpetual, obviously, because I'm assuming X, uh, my EBIT to be perpetual, obviously my debt is perpetual. So because of the perpetual EBIT, perpetual debt, perpetual tax, perpetual KD, I get this also as a perpetual earning. Now, if this is a perpetual earning, it's, its value becomes like this because this becomes the time value of money for perpetuity for the tax benefit of the debt. And this is the value of perpetuity of the uh, EBIT net of taxes. Okay, so EBIT uh, net of minus interest net of taxes. So EBIT net of taxes plus tax shield. So this is exactly the value of the unlevered form. So you have the value of the unlevered form plus the tax benefit. Okay, so you have the EBIT net of taxes divided by the cost of unlevered, which is essentially, you can also say that it is basically cost of equity because this was an unlevered form. So cost of equity, so EBIT net of taxes divided by cost of equity plus the tax benefit, which is basically, if I talk about perpetuity values, it becomes tax rate into my debt. Okay. So the value of the firm, which is levered, is equal to value of unlevered firm plus tax rate into the debt. Okay. So when taxes are introduced, specifically the tax deductibility of interest by the firm, the value of the firm is enhanced by the tax shield provided. So the, the terminology is the tax shield. So it's called the interest tax shield. Okay. So the tax shield basically lowers the cost of debt, obviously because the cost of debt is also net of taxes. 
and then it um, lowers WACC because obviously cost of debt becomes even lesser and it increases the value of the firm by the tax seal. Okay, so what do we say? Is optimal capital structure like 100% debt? Obviously, because you know, there you see that you have so much of tax advantage, then you have a reduced cost because of the tax advantage. So given these two things, I think you should have highest debt, which is like 100% debt. Um, and if I have to predict this graphically, this is the value of the unlevered firm, and this is the value of the levered firm, and the difference between the two is the value of the interest tax shield. Okay, so as we increase the leverage, obviously the tax shield increases because we are increasing debt. So as we increase debt, we have increased tax shield, and because of that, the levered firm, the difference between these two values, the value of the levered and the unlevered, also increases with increased leverage because of increased debt, which actually increases the tax shield. Okay, so this is with taxes. So um, then if that is the case, like we had said that we would prefer 100% debt, so why do companies not employ extreme levels of debt? Okay, extreme levels of debt are not employed because finally, as we had discussed in the beginning, that we are studying corporate structure, a capital structure for corporate value. Corporate value in the eyes of the equity shareholder. But let's understand, ultimately it's an investor whose wealth matters us the most. So the focus now shifts from the company because till now it was the company and the cost of capital for the company. So shifting the focus from the company to the investor now. So for the investor, how does the wealth change? There is a personal income tax which an investor also needs to pay. And investors could have two types of income debt and equity obviously for debt investors it will be debt income for equity investors it will be equity income let's also understand that tax on debt and tax of equity will be different especially because debt is giving you a tax shield so if debt is giving a tax shield it will also have the income reduced for the investor because for the debt income, the company does not pay the tax. So who pays? You pay it as an investor. For the equity income, you don't pay taxes in India. But then who pays it? Um, dividends are taxed by the government. So who pays the tax on it? The company pays the tax on it. So if there is no tax on dividends for the investor, then the company pays for it. So the government gets the tax whether you pay or the company pays. So in case of debt income, the company gets the tax shield, but you pay as an investor. But for equity income, you may not pay, but the company needs to pay. So now that means there is a corporate tax and a personal tax. So corporate taxes means there are taxes which you pay on the equity income, which you will distribute to the shareholders. Remember the assumption, all the income will go to the shareholder. And there are personal taxes, that is the tax rates which are charged on the investors because they have some income from the company. Okay, So now they say that corporate taxes reduce the earnings available for investors. Obviously because it's PAT. So there is some corporate, so remember there is some tax that is paid um, on the debt income which is paid by the investor. Then there is other income which is actually an equity income but the tax on that is already paid by the company. So if those tax rates are higher, then obviously the amount of money which is left for the investor, the equity investor, is much lower. So they say that um, too much of tax will actually reduce the earning for the investor. So tax becomes critical. But then they also say that um, you can take the tax advantage by having very high debt. But very high debt actually adds to the cost of financial distress because it increases your financial risk. So tomorrow, if something happens to my EBIT, who pays the interest? This is cost of financial distress. Who pays the interest if I am not earning enough? So we have to say that um, basically very high debt will add to the cost of financial distress. So we don't have very high debt. So then how do we decide where the company has to stop borrowing? The company needs to stop borrowing till it is able to give some advantage for both debt and equity shareholders. It has to ensure that debt holders get their due, equity holders also get their due, and the company does not pay very high taxes. And if the investor is paying the taxes, 
whether on debt or on equity income, the balance should be such that there is wealth maximization for all the investors. Now, because cost of debt is constant, so we are not expecting maximization or any change in the return for the debt investor, but we definitely are expecting change in return for the equity investor. So basically, um, there is, um, the, now we've just added on something called financial distress. So if I, if I have too much of debt, then there is this financial distress. But if I have too little debt, then I'm losing the tax benefit. So that means there is always a trade-off. There is a trade-off in how much debt should I use so that it gives me the best tax advantage, but also does not add to my distress cost. Okay, so there should not be any distress cost and there should be maximization of tax shield. So this trade-off theory says that you should have a trade-off. So the best value can be delivered to the firm when it has the maximum benefit of the tax shield minus the cost of financial distress. So the trade-off has to be between very high debt, which increases the tax shield, but also increases the distress cost. So if the distress cost becomes very high, then the tax shield will be negated. Because if this value is very high, so the minus here will reduce the plus. So we have to ensure that this tax shield is got, but without increasing my financial distress. So I cannot increase my debt beyond a point, however beneficial it may look to me because of the tax shield. You understand? So the trade-off theory says there'll be a trade-off between these two things, the value of the tax shield and the value of financial distress. So financial distress means if I do not have the money, who pays my interest? So that means it's cost of illiquidity actually. So that financial distress or agency cost should not be very high because it will take away all the benefit of the tax shield that we have tried to achieve by including debt. Okay, so this is the trade-off theory. Then there is another last theory which says the pecking order theory, which says announcement of share issues reduce the share price. So that means they're saying that if you want to change your capital structure, what should you do? The pegging theory says your first preference will be for internal finance. Why? Because it's just so easy. It's just there with you. Remember, it goes back to that assumption which we started with where we assumed that all the retained earnings are given to the investors. Or in other words, there is no retained earning for the firm. So if there is no retained earning for the firm, obviously this cannot happen. But then we are assuming that there is some retained earning. So all the internal funds generated by the firm are the first source of finance if the company wants to raise funds. If there is requirement beyond that, then the firm would like to have debt because it's cheap source and then equity, which is the last resort. Okay, the most profitable firms may borrow less, not because they have lower target debt ratios, but because they don't need external finance, simple. So you may not have debt, very high debt, because it's an internally financed company. So you, you kind of keep your financial distress cost to almost zero, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you do not enjoy tax benefits also. But then those tax benefits are assumed that um, the cost of raising funds internally is much lower compared to the cost of fund that are raised externally. So you trade off in this low cost of internal finance, um, which you would have uh, actually had to compensate if you went in for debt, which would, give, which would give the funds to you at some cost, but then they would give you some tax advantage also. Okay, so you keep on keep considering all these things, but then finally, the net result is that internal finance is preference number one, and then is debt, and then is equity. And please remember, when we issue equity, the investors think that the number of shares are suddenly going to get increased. So EPS shall reduce because PAT may not change, but number of shareholders changes. So PAT divided by number of shareholders. And if I'm raising new equity, so the number of shareholders are increasing, so my EPS is bound to decrease. 
So if my EPS is bound to decrease, my expected earning from the shareholder is also bound to decrease. Because of this expectation loss, the market price of the share goes low. This is the pecking order theory. Now, reconciliation of trade-off and pecking order theory says that firms will have long-run target debt ratios as dictated by the trade-off theory. When the debt ratio deviates from the target ratio, firms consider the cost of adjustment by following the pecking order. So that means there is a target ratio which the trade-off theory gives you, which is the trade-off between the financial distress cost and the tax advantage. Now, if supposing the, there is a deviation because of some loan repayment or something which has happened or you have just come out with some rights issue or something or maybe bonus issue. So we suddenly see there is an increase in equity and we want to maintain the balance or something like that. So there is there's some reason why the capital structure is changing. So if I have to raise funds to maintain my debt equity ratio, the pecking order theory will say that I will first go to internal sources, then I would go to debt, and then I would go to equity. Okay. So um, the firm may delay issuing equity to lower its debt ratio if adverse selection costs are high and has to underprice its share heavily. Okay. So we say that to be able to reach the target ratio, we actually need to understand how the firm will achieve the target ratio and that will be done using the pecking order theory. Okay. Now, um, we have just studied as to, you know, uh, we, were, we were studying capital structure with respect to change. Okay, so we were basically analyzing capital structure changes. So the evaluation criteria for all the changes should be, are we creating value? Are we creating competitive advantage? Are we able to sustain the objectives and the business model of the firm? And so these are the questions which have to be answered whenever we are doing a capital structure change. So any capital structure change which does not increase value, which does not give you a competitive advantage, which does not help you sustain in your objectives, you should not change the capital structure. Or in other words, you should go in for a change if you think that the change will bring about more value, more competitive advantage, and will sustain the strategic objectives of the firm. Okay, so basically the objective of studying capital structure was to create value, what we started with, to create competitive advantage, again what we started with, and to uh, sustain the strategic objectives. Okay. Now, um, when I'm doing these changes, so when a company is changing its capital structure, what should it think about? It should think about its flexibility. Um, that means how fast can I raise my structure, my capital, and at what cost? Then is risk, whether I'll be able to service the debt and avoid distress, as we have discussed earlier. What will be the impact on the net earnings for the shareholders? What will be the impact on the existing shareholders' control of the firm? And is it the best time to raise particular classes and maturities of capital? So we study, and this analysis is called the Fricked Analysis. Okay, So we have to necessarily conduct the Fricked Analysis to analyze changes in capital structure. Okay. So um, we have studied what will what could be the impact of capital structure and we will study, uh, we have studied what are the factors which can influence them and the various theories, the way they propose that the, uh, the, uh, the way the capital structure will influence the value of the firm. So now summarizing our discussion. Goal of the capital structure is to determine the financial leverage, which maximizes the value. The MM theory developed without taxes, capital structure is irrelevant. Deductibility of interest lowers the cost of debt and the cost of capital. So adding the tax shield provided by the debt framework suggests optim optimal capital structure is all debt. Then with and without taxes, increasing a company's relative use of debt increases the risk for equity providers and hence the cost of equity. So when there are bankruptcy costs, a high debt ratio increases the risk of bankruptcy. 
So using more debt in a company's capital structure basically reduces the net agency cost of equity. Cost of asymmetric information increases as more equity is used versus debt, suggesting the pecking order theory of leverage in which new equity issuance is the least preferred method of raising capital. According to the static trade-off theory of capital structure, in choosing a capital structure, a company balances the value of the tax benefit from the deductibility of interest with the present value of the cost of financial distress. So we have to uh, always have a balance between financial distress and tax benefit. So incremental tax shield benefit is exactly offset by the incremental cost of financial distress and that becomes the target capital uh, structure. Company may identify its capital structure, but its capital structure at any point in time may not be equal to its target for different reasons. Why? Because if I am doing some loan repayments, then obviously my capital structure is changing every month or every year. Okay. So many companies have goals for maintaining a certain credit rating, and these goals are influenced by the relative costs of debt financing among the different rating classes. Okay. In evaluating a company's capital structure, financial analysts must look at the capital structure of the company over time, capital structure of competitors who have similar risk and similar factors which affect their agency costs. Good corporate governance and accounting transparency should lower the net agency cost of equity. Obviously, because if there's transparency and good governance, your shareholders are happy. And if they're happy, the cost of equity will not change. So when comparing capital structures of companies in different countries, an analyst must consider a variety of characteristics that might differ and affect both the typical capital structure and the debt maturity capital structure. Okay, so essentially we have covered most of the aspects of how capital structure can influence the value of the company both in the eyes of the investors as well as for the company itself okay so now we come to the end of our presentation and uh, i hope the theories of capital structure are now clear to you okay so uh, i i close my class here now okay